It's also set dressing. I read it as an ebook. It was published in the year of our Lord, 1949, to describe the natural conclusion of authoritarian propaganda. There are multiple other dystopian novels from that era, such as Brave New World by Hedalus Huxley and Animal Farm, which is also written by George Orwell. Despite that 1984 is an unapologetically anti-fascist book, a lot of internet fascists like to cite it in their arguments, for whatever reason. Recently on the internet, a lot of people have started to take on the mantra, literally 1984, to describe any number of pointless garbage. Sometimes it's done as a joke, and sometimes it's done completely straight, but I really think it's an interesting development, and it's never used applicably, whether it's a joke or whether it's serious. Of course, when it's a joke, it's pretty obvious that it's used inapplicably. That's like the joke. It's a joke to call Cheetos literally 1984 with no basis. But when it's used seriously, it is also used unapplicably almost all of the time. So I want to take a look at that and what being used applicably even means in this case. Before we get into the book, it's important to explain to you about it. People on the right try to say that it's an allegory for communism and people on the left try to say it's an allegory for fascism, but it's more nuanced than that. People say 1984 is an allegory for Stalin or Hitler, and they're right in both. Here's an officially endorsed drawing showing Big Brother as a mix of Stalin and Hitler. Uh, I always pictured him as Howard Stark in Iron Man 2, but maybe that's just me. But setting mustaches aside, Hitler and Stalin are a lot more similar than a lot of people realize. Fascism does not necessarily mean that communism is not in place. They're not mutually exclusive. There's a thing called the third position, which is fascism for anti-capitalists. And Stalin didn't really do that much communism. He mostly just killed people and said that it was communism, which is exactly what Hitler did. They both just stole a left-wing word to sound left-wing. For God's sake, Nazi is a shortening of national socialist. They're both fascist, it's just that one of them was a lot more brutal in the ethnic violence part. Not that Stalin's Soviet Union was an integrated utopia, of course, but Hitler was worse. And actually, state-imposed ethnic violence is not necessary for fascism. It's very common, but there just needs to be something to rally against. It can even be other fascists. That's what happens in 1984. The elements of the book draw heavy parallels to things that both Hitler and Stalin did. There really aren't that many things in here that draw parallels to just one of them. Both governments heavily destroyed the free press and killed anyone who disagreed with them, among a bunch of other random people. In fact, 1984 was banned in the Soviet Union for being too anti-communist, and in the U.S. for being too communist, which just indicates that both governments are just banning anything that disagrees with them. The book opens by setting up our world and our protagonist. The society we see in 1984 is a police state which is surveilling its citizens using what I call the Vash and Narada principle. The Vash and Narada are an alien from Doctor Who who pretends to be shadows. If you step in a shadow that's actually Vash and Narada, you die. They're really dangerous, and the reason why is best exemplified by this scene actually from the episode. Not everyone comes back out of the dark. Every shadow? No. But any shadow. The Vash and Narada principle is essentially the idea that Everything might not be dangerous, there might be some things that are safe, but it's impossible to tell whether or not something is dangerous, so you have to act as if it is dangerous because there's no way to know whether or not it is. This is how surveillance works in 1984. It's impossible to know whether or not you're being spied on at any specific moment, but you could be. You have to act as if you always are. Another kind of funny example of this is Santa Claus. Obviously, it's logistically impossible for Santa Claus to be spying on every single child in the world, or every child in the world that celebrates Christmas for an entire year. But the fact that every child is told that they might be being spied on convinces them to pretend to be good, at least in the month of December. A much more tangible example of this is the Panopticon, which was a prison invented by some British guy named Jeremy Bentham in like the 1700s or something. It works based off the principle that there's one guard tower in the center, and the prison is engineered such that every single cell can be theoretically viewed by someone sitting in that guard tower. 
Every prisoner has to act as if they're being spied on because they don't know if they are or not. They have to presume that they are because they could be caught for anything they do and not know that until they're caught. There are posters everywhere telling the populace that Big Brother is watching you. Like the one that I showed earlier of Stalin and Hitler, the gay love child. 1984 is the origin of the term thought police, who in this book are a literal police force and will be important to the plot later. Our protagonist is a middle-aged man named Winston who works at the Ministry of Truth in the Records Department. If you've never read this book, that sentence did not make sense at all. You got, ah, he's a middle-aged man named Winston, that's it. His job is taking records which are counterproductive to the aims of the party and correcting them so that they are not. Once this has been done, everyone who has a copy of the original record throws it down a hole called the memory hole for it to be incinerated. The way the surveillance is actually orchestrated is through these massive screens called telescreens, such that if you can see what's on the screen, then the screen can see you. Winston's apartment is really awkwardly designed, so there's a corner where he can sit there and not see the telescreen. So essentially, as long as he sits there and is completely silent, he can do whatever he wants. Winston starts a diary in that corner, which isn't technically illegal because nothing is. There are no laws in 1984. It's not anarchy, there's still a governing body which enforces what it wants to happen, but there's no set out system of rules for what is and isn't allowed. The legal system is run by the Bhakti Narada principle. If you think that taking an action may get you punished, but you don't actually know, then you can interpret it as this is allowed while simultaneously not doing it because it's too risky. Actually, everyone must watch a two minute video about a traitor to the party named Emanuel Goldstein. This is really successful at getting people angry, which is the goal. It even gets Winston angry even though he hates the party. The entire point of this is to set an atmosphere of anger which can be thrown into the furnace of the party. Goldstein is Jewish and the book really exemplifies that for some funny reason. While it's handled really poorly because it's a book from 1949, the point is essentially that they chose him because he's Jewish rather than any of the other dissenters. For all we know, he never actually existed and they just made him up and made him Jewish because doing that would make him a more effective rallying point to rally against. So it is actually that. That's revealed later in the book. During the two minute tape, which that video I mentioned earlier didn't give a name to, Winston sees a woman who he's sexually attracted to and hates her because the party pushes the idea that women shouldn't have sex with him, and he suspects that she believes it. Winston is an incel. This is not a joke, it's simply a statement of fact. Also to clarify, he doesn't hate this just this one woman, he hates all women because he thinks they support the party more than men, and therefore would refuse to have sex with men. For this reason, he suspects that the woman is spying on him with no evidence. The party has an irrational hatred of sex. There's a government agency called the Anti-Sex League which sounds like the premise of a shit-posting parody Hunger Games ripoff. The party's propaganda that they use on women is incredibly centered on the idea of chastity. They really don't like sex outside of marriage, or inside of marriage, actually. Even the most anti-sexual religions have circumstances where sex is at least okay, because if you don't do that, you're gonna die out, like what happened in the Shakers. Now, the party doesn't completely forbid sex, they do allow it exclusively for procreation, but they do it in a lot more of a scientific way than like the Catholic Church does. I'm sure that if this book was written in a time when artificial insemination was a lot more common, then they would have just outlawed sex entirely. Porn is actually produced by the Ministry of Truth in 1984, but it's only distributed to the proles. There are three classes of people in 1984, the proles and the inner and outer party. I'm not going to talk about the differences between the inner and outer party until later, but essentially the proles don't have as much propaganda control exerted over them. However, the proles are also second-class citizens. Prole is just a singular form of proletariat, which is a word that's been associated with communism just because Marx used it, but isn't actually required to be associated with communism. It just means the working class. This is not what the proles are in 1984. They are just the system's underclass. The word prole was chosen by the party to sound communist and left-wing, but obviously it didn't work, because if they were actually communist, there would be no underclass. Communism is centered around the idea of abolishing the class system, so if you actually want to abolish the class system, you can't be like, let's abolish the class system and replace it with a new one. The party is officially called INSOC, which is an abbreviation of English Socialism. But that doesn't mean that they're remotely left-wing. The Nazis used the word socialist. As I mentioned before, Nazi is short for National Socialist, which sounds a lot more like English Socialist than English Socialist sounds like Socialist. Winston mentions how all the history books talk about how the problem was capitalism, and yet they still run under a society based on a system of class, just not one based on money. 
the party's ideology is inherently contradictory, which is a massive point of the book. This is called Doublethink, which is one of the fancy 1984 words you might know. Doublethink is when people who believe in the party have contradictory beliefs. An example that the party uses that I will also repeatedly use multiple times in this video is that the party attests to that democracy is impossible, but also that the party is democratic and therefore good. New speak is a conlang created by the party for the express purpose of controlling the people. The idea is essentially that if you remove the words that would be necessary to make thought crime possible, no one can do it anymore because they can't say the thing that they want to say or think the thing that they want to think because people think in words. For example, if there's no word overthrow in the dictionary, you can't talk about overthrowing the government. The New Speak Dictionary writer tells Winston, You think, dare I say, that our chief job is inventing new words, but not a bit of it. We're actually destroying words, scores of them, hundreds of them every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. Don't you see that the whole aim of New Speak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word, with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point. A lot of people who even know the slightest thing about linguistics are probably rolling their fucking eyes right now, and so am I, because fuck the severe warp hypothesis. But in this circumstance, what they're doing actually would work, and I'll get a bit into that later. A lot of this book is just Winston wallowing in his own helplessness in comparison to the enormity of the party. Basically, if he gets caught, he's going to get removed from history along with his diary, and he doesn't like that thought even a little bit. Why would why would he like it a little bit? Actually, why the fuck would he like be like? I'm, I'm just a it's just a little mischievous. I like the idea of like I. It's just a little funky, like being deleted from all of history. Winston talks about how little of his past life he can even remember. Because the past of 1984 is fluid, your life, which is also contextualized by the events of the past, is also fluid. When the party is gaslighting you into believing that their version of the past is correct, then your life, which is contextualized by the events of the past as well, is also put into question. There's probably a good point here to make about historical revisionism, but I'm not talking about critical race theory in this video or any of that stuff, so uh, someone else make that video for me, or I'll, maybe I'll just do it in the future as an addendum or something. Through uh, happenstance, don't worry about it, Winston finds himself at the place where he originally bought the diary, and the owner of the shop shows him upstairs to a secret room which is completely furnished and has no telescreens, so he can't be spied on while he's in there. As he leaves the shop, he sees the person who he thinks is spying on him drop a curtain on Act 1. Oh yeah, um, 1984 is divided up into parts and also chapters. I have no idea why. I called it Act 1, presumably because it's fucking Homestuck, but it's, it's essentially called Part 1, which makes it really confusing because it's like Chapter 27. That's in Part 3, but it's also, like, not ordered by the number of parts in each chapter. So it's like Part 1... And then it contains these chapters, but it's not like part one, chapter one, two, three, etc. And then part two, chapter one, two, three, etc. It's part one is chapters one through ten, and then part two is chapters eleven through I think twenty one, and then part three is way shorter. It's 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 really fucking infuriating. Also, I didn't check those numbers, so no one quote me on them. <laughs> spying on him, goes up and hands him a note. He opens it and it says, I love you, and instantly he's ecstatic. Because the entire reason why he hates women is because they don't want to have sex with him. So as soon as one consents to having sex with him, he's just like, holy shit, yes. He doesn't stop being a bit of an incel, but at least now he doesn't hate at least this one woman. For the next few days, through a bunch of rom-com shenanigans, Winston and that girl meet up and exchange information where she can then come up with a plan of how to meet up in a place where the party can't spy on them. In this encounter, he makes a particular mention of how Mongolians are racially profiled by the party and are more likely to be disappeared than white people because the enemies are Eurasia and East Asia. Uh, Mongolian is just the term that they used for Asians in 1949, I think is when the book was published. I actually know that. I don't know why I was stuttering. This is the only mention of the party being racist in the book. Winston goes to the meeting place and makes out with the girl before proceeding to ask her name. Not the order I would have done those things, but okay. Her name is Julia, by the way. I considered calling her the girl Winston thinks is spying on him for the entire book because her only character traits are in service of Winston, 
But then I realized that it kind of probably hurt my credibility to act like I don't know one of the main characters' names. Anyways, about a minute later, she asked Winston what his perception of her was when he first noticed that she was following him. And he admits to wanting to rape and murder her. Just because. And that's not an exaggeration, that's what the book says. This is not me being like, oh, X, Y, Z, because he's an incel. No, he just straight up says that. I think this is what happens when you ban love and sex. People get really bad at being a normal human being. She offers him some chocolate, and she explains how her chocolate isn't shitty because she got it from the black market. They start dating in secret and hanging out a lot, and they always have to come up with really specific plans of where to go so that the party can't spy on them. And Julia has a lot of experience in this because she's so hot and cool and girl boss and whatever. Most of the important world building that is even relevant yet is already been done at this point. The only things that are left to be built in the world, I don't know if that's the right verb, but let's just roll with it, are all things that happen later on after Winston gets arrested for sleeping with Julia. So for the most part, all the stuff involving Julia is all just plot, and I only am talking about it because I feel obliged to. I really don't care. This is the worst part of the book. And uh, there's also a lot of sex scenes, which is the other worst part of the book. Winston tells a story about his childhood, where he, when living with his mother and sister, would take more than his fair share of rations, and eventually it caused his family to become malnourished. The point of this story is that taking more than you need is a bad thing, and that you should only take what you need and leave the rest for other people to have. And people still have the audacity to look at this book and be like, this is a thing about communism, because communism is bad, and under communism, uh, you take more than you need and then uh, leave it for other people to not have as much. Uh, that's really what people believe about communism. <laughs> Winston talks to a guy named O'Brien about the new Newspeak dictionary and learns through a whole bunch of coded language that O'Brien doesn't support the party. Uh, if you have already read this book, don't spoil it for people that haven't. He talks about meeting at O'Brien's place that he can give Winston the new Newspeak dictionary, Too New to Speak as a guise for inducting Winston into the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is Goldstein's semi-mythical secret club. They go to O'Brien's house and learn about all the amenities that inner party members have, namely better food, uh, a nicer house, a servant named Martin for some reason, and most importantly, a telescreen that can be turned off. We learn that the Brotherhood exists, and yes, it is run by Emmanuel Goldstein, however, the Brotherhood is very loosely organized. Each member only knows a few others, and it's just a kind of web of connections between people who everyone knows. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme. If necessary, members are surgically changed to be different people so that they can avoid the thought police. But if they're caught, because they don't really know anyone, they can't rat out the entire brotherhood. They can only rat out a couple people who can then be surgically changed into other people and go into hiding. But there is no unity. The brotherhood's members only act in nebulous ways against the party, such as, oh, I'm gonna steal a couple boots from this one place so that the party has fewer boots. This is partially done for protection. You can't have a circumstance where one person and the people they know are able to organize an entire coup. And it's done partially for practicality, where it's just really, really hard to overthrow a fascist government when you live inside that fascist government. Winston agrees to do his order and uh, Winston agrees to do his orders and die if he has to, and then he is given instructions on how to get a copy of Goldstein's manifesto. Also, Julia was there, but she was kind of passive in that conversation. She just sort of sat in the corner while O'Brien and Winston talked about stuff. Needless to say, uh, 1984 does not pass the Bechdel test. Winston goes to get his book, and then we get part two, chapter nine, which is the longest chapter in the book because it contains 24 pages of fictional theory. On the one hand, I love this because I love reading theory and I love extensive world building. But on the other hand, what the fuck, George? That's actually not his name. His, his name is actually Eric Blair. But uh, George Orwell is his pen name, but I'm not going to dead name him. The book's on admission, this doesn't really teach Winston anything, although it does teach the reader a bit about the state of affairs within the wider world of 1984, besides just in Oceania. But I feel like since Winston already knew this, it probably should have been brought up in the first part, when Winston is just responding to random stimuli with what specific information about how the party works is being conveyed to the audience. The good thing about this section, though, is that it gives a very easy litmus test about whether or not someone actually paid attention to reading the book. Because this shit is very, very leftist. And this is the leading opposition to the party. Goldstein literally just fucking says that the party in 1984 is the logical conclusion of capitalism. And that if you don't get rid of capitalism, you will end up with the situation that you have in 1984. This is literally in the book, and if you haven't read this, 
this is the one thing you bring up to someone who has read it, so you can pretend to have read it. By the way, I'm not condoning getting into arguments about 1984 when you haven't read 1984, uh, but I did that before I actually read the book, so fuck you. Honestly, that's the main reason why I made this video, is so that I can just say, man, I've read 1984 now, and then get into an argument about it. He also talks about how Oceania, East Asia, and Eurasia are just three of the same dictatorship with different coats of paint. You know, like Hitler and Stalin. If you read any part of this book, read this section. It's comparatively not that long, and it shows a lot about the world of 1984 and the political implications of what the party is doing in what is only 24 pages of a Kindle. I have a PDF in my sources. Uh, if you do look in the sources, though, it is more than 40 pages, I think. It's more than 24. It's a lot more just because the pages are weird, but it starts on page 233, and you just read until it goes back to plot. Rizzo and Julia get caught by a microphone and a telescreen, which is behind a painting in their furnished room where they were having sex. I didn't mention that because I feel like the sex scenes aren't that important. Uh, I will make a lot of jokes about them later, though. Anyways, Winston gets knocked out. Drop curtain on part two. Part one has a lot of world building about 1984 society. Part two has a lot of sex scenes and plot and fictional theory and general fear. And then part three has a lot of world building about the inner workings of how the party is actually structured. This is my favorite part of the book. And it is incredibly well done. Like, honestly, reading this book, I read the first two parts and I was like, okay, this is like a very important book and it's thematically very interesting, but it's not good. And then I got to part three and I was like, okay, no, actually, this is a good book. When Winston is initially arrested, he finds himself in a room with a lot of other people, but eventually he gets moved to a room of solitary confinement. Uh, unrelated note, when he was in the room where he was with a bunch of other people, he met someone who's like very heavily implied to be his mother, and like the book is just like, I could be your mother, and then just never mentions it again, it does not affect Winston at all. I think it's really weird. Despite being reminiscent of solitary confinement, other people are moved between cells and sometimes end up in Winston's cell, and he gets an opportunity to talk to them. He has conversations with the other inmates and is basically just beaten to shit for basically no reason, and that's really important. He hears people being called into a room that's ominously named Room 101, which is apparently horrifying, and people are begging for literally anything to avoid being taken to. Eventually, Winston is taken to a room where he is tortured by O'Brien, who gives wrong answers to questions that he asks. Oh, O'Brien's actually a bad guy, by the way, don't worry about it. This is where the iconic 2 plus 2 equals 5 scene happens. Crucially, this is something that the party does just to prove to Winston that their concept of material truth does not exist. Crucially, this isn't something that the party does because they benefit from Winston believing that 2 plus 2 equals 5. They do it just to convince him that the concept of truth does not exist. And that's why I feel like anyone who brings up the 2 plus 2 equals 5 thing in an argument is inherently misinterpreting the scene. Because the point of the scene is not that Winston's being convinced 2 plus 2 equals 5 because the party is just that wacky. He's being convinced 2 plus 2 equals 5 because if he's convinced 2 plus 2 equals 5, he can believe anything the party tells him, and that's the point. O'Brien argues in a fundamentally skeptical view of the world. I said skeptical in quotes because, yes, that's what the philosophical movement is called, and it is not the same thing as what we would ordinarily call skepticism. Skepticism, parentheses, philosophy, is not actually just looking at things and determining whether they're true or not. It is the philosophy in which truth cannot exist because you can't really prove anything, can you? There are many things that can be drawn from this, from the idea that everything is real to someone and therefore everything is real, which I think is the premise of American Gods. And then there's another end of the spectrum where the only thing that is real is your own thoughts. O'Brien takes a very interesting middle ground that was pretty popular in the 17th century, where the only things that are real are things that are currently being observed. O'Brien takes a picture of some traitors that Winston was tasked with destroying when he was working at the Ministry of Truth and asks him if Winston remembers it. Winston says he remembers it, and then O'Brien throws it into the memory hole. He asks the question again, to which Winston responds that he remembers it again and that the photo still exists. And then O'Brien says that it doesn't exist because it's been incinerated, to which... Winston says, but that photo still was taken. And O'Brien says, I don't think it was taken. This kind of breaks Winston, and he has this very interesting psychoanalysis of O'Brien. If he could have been certain that O'Brien was lying, it would not have seemed to matter, but it was perfectly possible that O'Brien had really forgotten the photograph. O'Brien's cutoff point is that 
memories aren't worth shit. The only thing that matters is if a physical record of the thing is known to currently exist. After a whole bunch of these torture sessions, Winston says that he still knows better than the party, and that O'Brien shows him a mirror, which is the first time he's seen his reflection since he got arrested. Winston is horribly malnourished and on the eve to his death, and he's able to see that in himself. The description is actually really disgusting, so I'm not going to say anything more, but if you want to know what it says, just look it up. Anything about this book can be looked up, actually. There's a PDF on it for free. I don't think the book's in the public domain, but fuck the law. By the way, that doesn't make what Winston says any more or less true, but it is very convincing to him about what the party thinks. O'Brien says that the party can just decide that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and Winston says that math is rigid and that it will always be 4, even if you call it 5. O'Brien argues for a collective truth, that the only thing that is true is what everyone says is true. Which I definitely agree with for math, because, like, if you just decide that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, the number 4 would cease to exist, and we would represent it with the number 5 and call it 5. I mean, at its core, Newspeak is just a con lane. It's a politically biased one, and it's really fucking weird. I mean, they call things that are horrible double plus ungood, but it's just a con lane. It's actually a Conlang concept called oligosynthesis. Uh, I'm not going to explain it, but you can Google it or watch the Conlang critic video about Tokipana. Uh, I don't have time for this. This video is long enough. From this point forward, Winston starts accepting the party, initially just because he wants to either leave or die, but eventually he actually starts believing some of it. The conditioning is working on him. The party intentionally makes his conditions better so that they can associate good conditions with themselves and bad conditions with dissidents. Prisoners aren't just executed. The party learned from the mistakes of the real authoritarian regimes on which it is based, which O'Brien explains as almost getting the point but not going far enough, which if the fictional theory did not convince you what this book is about, this probably should have. The party knows from experience that executing dissidents doesn't work because it creates martyrs. By having them turn against their own side and then killing them, there are no martyrs. Winston initially hopes to deep down still hate the party, out, just out of spite. He doesn't want to fall into their system, even though it doesn't really matter. No one knew who he was. He isn't a meaningful martyr. But he just wants to hate them out of spite. But eventually it works. Eventually they convince him of all the things that they want him to believe. O'Brien asks Winston for his opinion on Big Brother and says that he will know if he's lying. Winston says, truthfully, that he hates Big Brother thinking that it doesn't really matter, because you can hate someone and still agree with them. Instead, he's taken to Room 101. Room 101 contains nothing in it except a table and a box, which is essentially a boggart from Harry Potter. I mean, fuck J.K. Rowling, but, like, it's, it's a really good comparison. The box contains the thing which, to the person who is being tortured, is the most effective means of torture, the thing they're least likely to be able to endure. For Winston, that's rats. They put a machine that, like, tortures him with rats on his head, and then... He begs for Julia to be put in his place, which gets O'Brien to stop. Winston is finally let out, and I feel like it's important that we set out what the party is doing with Winston. First, they associate non-compliance with being beaten for no reason, starvation, and dehydration. They put him in a room with a man who is begging not to be taken to room 101 while literally starving to death. They then show him his decrepit body and how helpless he is against the party. Once he complies, they give him better conditions. Finally, they break off the social connections that he has to his past life at the time. Winston is let out, and his final chapter is just the denouement of someone who's living the normal life that the party wants them to live. 1984 is just the hero's journey in reverse. 1984 is the story of a man being broken down from a hero to being just a cog in the machine of an ordinary world. Except for the part about wanting to rape Julia, like, that, does, that analogy doesn't really work in the hero's journey thing, but, like, let's ignore that for now. Class story time is over now, kids. Of course, the things described in 1984 didn't go away in 1953 when Stalin died and the Soviet Union just became a normal dictatorship. And it's not because of North Korea or China or any other dictatorship. The reason why 1984 is so relevant is because 1984 is, at its core, about lying hard enough and confidently enough that people willingly give up power to you. The threat that Orwell is bringing up in 1984 is about the party, yes, but it's also just about general censorship and lying and standard issue gaslighting. Because frankly, people who live in North Korea neither have the power to read the book nor to change anything. And nearly everyone is opposed to North Korea except for people who benefit from it existing. Yes, there are people who legitimately believe that Kim Jong-un's government is good, but they aren't the target audience, are they? 
The target audience for anti-fascist media like 1984 is neoliberals to get them to give a shit about fascism. They already are on paper opposed to fascism because of the dictatorship aspect, but they need to be shown more the specific horrors of it and how to identify an aspiring fascist. And especially, they need to be shown the next step for fascism. While Brian is molding Winston and showing him the actual real philosophy of this party, there's this part about them learning from past dictatorships. In summary, with bits cut out for time, you can read the whole thing if you want, he says basically that In the Middle Ages, there was the Inquisition. It was a failure. The Inquisition killed its enemies in the open, and killed them while they were still unrepentant. In fact, it killed them because they were unrepentant. There were the German Nazis and the Russian Communists. They imagined that they had learned from the mistakes of the past. They knew, at any rate, that one must not make martyrs. The dead men had become martyrs and their degradation was forgotten. In the first place, because the confessions that they had made were obviously extorted and untrue. We do not make mistakes of this kind. Essentially, they learn from the mistakes of the fascists of the past. And this is set in the future of our actual past. This is an alternate history. The party are meant to be a prediction of the fascists of today. Of course, they don't have the power to institute anything like the party does, but they certainly wish that they could exercise that. There's an important distinction to be made between lying and being wrong. Because, of course, fascists are wrong. But they're also deliberate liars. That's the point of 1984. When O'Brien is trying to convince Winston of what the party believes, he absolutely knows that that photo existed, whether he threw it down the memory hole or not, that's how fucking object permanence. By willfully lying, O'Brien is exercising the key to the rise of fascism, making shit up. Fascism is built on top of conspiracism, typically about conspiracies arguing that the existence of minorities is somehow atrophying white people. I feel like here's a good time to mention that fascism doesn't specifically have to be about race, there just needs to be someone to rally against. It's typically xenophobia because fascism is an inherently nationalist ideology, and usually that's tied to some form of racial otherness or other type of thing to distinguish the people that are in the in-group from the people in the out-group. So while yes, race is most popular now and during Nazi Germany times, it doesn't have to be. A popular flavor of straight-up lie right now is the type of the sexually transmitted bad thing. This is based on the idea that the people who the fascist argues should not be fucking are spreading something bad by fucking. For example, the white genocide conspiracy. Basically, because society has argued that mixed-race children who are half-white are not white, you can logically extrapolate from that that eventually white people will cease to exist. If you argue based on the one-drop rule, then everyone will eventually be 0.01% not white and can argue to their Lularo friends that they can say the N-word. Of course, this makes no fucking sense. First off, it's not a genocide if no one is being killed or prevented from having kids. Second off, it's not deliberate. And technically they're right that if we define being white as being 100% white, not rounded, that eventually white people will cease to exist. But who the fuck cares? It doesn't affect you. Or anyone, really. A person cannot be affected by quote-unquote white genocide because once a person is born, they just exist. The demographic change does not affect them. Unless, of course, your problem is that fewer white people means that there's more people of color and you don't like people of color. Spoiler, it is that. Second, if you don't like it, just decide that mixed race people are white. You're not wrong. I mean, I guess you are wrong if the, they're mixed race and neither of the races are white, but that's not the point. The people make the rules and they have been changed before. If you're truly concerned about this for the reasons that you claim, you can just change the rules. Anyways, I would have been remiss if I didn't mention this specific case, but there are other ones which you might not have heard of. In India, there's an idea called Love Jihad, which is essentially the same idea except specifically about Muslim men marrying Hindu women. Yes, this is still a video about 1984 by George Orwell. Instead of being based off of racism's idea of who is and isn't white, Love Jihad is predicated on the incorrect assertion that Islam is somehow sexually transmitted. This isn't a joke. These people believe that Hindu women will fall in love with Muslim men and then have Muslim babies and convert the Hindu women to being Muslim. Which is only a problem because of nationalism. The situation in India with fascism is complicated, and if I tried to make an entire video about it, I'd probably anger a whole bunch of people from India, and it wouldn't be that interesting of a video. And if I talked about it as a small part in a video about something else, I would do it wrong. So let's just leave that there. So, why does fascism hate consensual sex? Well, as scholars Kaplana Wilson, Jennifer Unlo, and Nagpesh Purawal say, it's about the consensual part. These fascists, who are almost all men, although there are exceptions, 
don't like the idea of putting something that is perceived as important within the hands of women. Of course, that's only half the story, because it's also put into the hands of men, but suspiciously the idea of men from the majority having sex with women from the minority is somehow ignored. In fact, while a lot of the anti-miscegenation laws in the American South were technically gender neutral, they were rarely ever enforced when white men had sex with black women. So problem solved, right? Fascists don't want giving agency to people of color and to women. And while that is true, and it is a problem, it's not the only one. Because keep in mind that none of this is true. They just say that love jihad or white genocide is happening without backing it up. Okay, that's not actually true. They do actually back it up with data, but it's pretty dubious, and it projects current data trends into the future without taking into account that they will change, which is really something that you would only do if you were doing data analysis without knowing calculus, which you shouldn't do and call your data analysis accurate. The point of all of this is that they lie for personal benefit. No one smart is meant to believe that white genocide or love jihad is happening. They're just able to use it as a shield. This is the nuance that Doublethink misses, at least in our current society. Doublethink is based off of the idea that I believe X and I also believe Y, but they are contradictory. Therefore, Doublethink. In reality, it works such as I believe X, but if I say I believe Y, then people will not know that I believe X, because believing X is not socially acceptable, and maybe they will believe Y, and if they believe Y, they will act in the same way as someone who believes X, so it doesn't really matter that they don't believe X, because they're acting in the same way. Now, of course, I also believe W, but of course, I want to tell people I believe Z. Now, Y and Z are contradictory, but W and X aren't. So really, it doesn't matter, and it's not really a problem that they're contradictory, because I don't actually believe them. I just need other people to believe them so I can use them as pawns. The way that fascism is executed is through doublethink. That's the point of its inclusion in 1984. One cannot both believe in protection of white women from black men to prevent mixed race pregnancies, and then at the same time, as a white man, sexually abuse black women without contraceptives. Of course, also the idea that mixed race pregnancies are a problem is false, but that's not the point. One cannot both believe that abortion is murder and should therefore be outlawed, and then also believe that the cops murdering people should not be outlawed. One cannot both believe that the Republican Party is superior because it is, quote, in favor of democracy, and then also believe that a Republican president should declare himself a dictator. This last example is something which people believe, and is almost the same as an example used by 1984 to explain doublethink. To repudiate morality while laying claim to it. To believe that democracy was impossible, and that the party was the guardian of democracy. Okay, maybe it's not verbatim, but it does have the same idea. Venerating the idea of democracy when it supports the people to whom you are acolytes, and opposing democracy when it supports people who you are in opposition to. Someone had to have convinced Caitlin Bennett that A, those are good beliefs, and B, they're not contradictory. This is what 1984 is about, the condemning of truth, and then appealing to truth within your arguments. It's about only caring about stopping sexual assault when sexual assault leaves trans people existing. It's about stopping consensual sex between black men and white women, and not stopping non-consensual sex between white men and black women. And it's about telling people you're a bastion of democracy as you try to overthrow it. Okay, time to go on a tangent. I feel like the main argument against the idea that we live in a society like 1984 is because we live in a capitalist neoliberal representative republic and not a totalitarian dictatorship. However, I, as well as other people such as, of all people, Vladimir Lenin, would argue that fascism is the logical conclusion of the societal structure which we currently have. There's a lot of ways to illustrate this idea, such as a deconstruction of the Kamazot scene in the original in time parentheses 1962, that's really important, the movie isn't good, or Free Guy, Walking into an American Suburb, or the Lego movie. I'm going to choose the Lego movie partially because I think it's funniest, and partially because I think it best illustrates a concept which I'm going to explain later. However, any of these would be useful analysis for 1984 in the same way that the Lego movie is. So if you say, go to my high school and have to write a paper about 1984 junior year, feel free to steal my ideas. Don't steal the ideas from this video. Steal the ideas from the things I just listed. Uh, if you steal ideas from my video, that's plagiarism and you will not get a good grade. 1984 and the Lego movie do unironically have a lot in common, though. 
The plot structure is radically different, especially considering that one was rated PG by the MPAA, which means it's probably safe to show to a fetus without supervision. The MPAA is just a bunch of overconcerned moms, we'll get to that later. And the other is 45% sex scenes. So the Lego movie follows Emmett, voiced by Chris Pratt, who is the chosen one called the special by the movie, around various different worlds themed after the different Lego themes to prevent, well, I'll get back to that. The important part of the Lego movie as it relates to 1984 is not about the plot or the message or the characters, or even most of the movie. It's about the villain's plan and the world he runs. The villain of the Lego movie is President Business, not voiced by Chris Pratt. His entire plan is to use the craggle, which is just glue, to stick everything exactly how he wants it. At the same time, he has, since the start of the movie, been prescribing what people should be doing. This is done in the form of instruction manuals, which the audience is meant to parallel to the instruction manuals that come in Lego sets, but if we don't take them at face value, these are produced by Octan, the corporation slash government that President Business runs. In fact, there's this entire scene, which according to one YouTube commenter and literally no one else, I could not back this up, but I think it's such a weird thing that if someone could back it up and actually prove it to be true, it would make this entire story way funnier. Apparently, according to this one guy, the AT&T pay-per-view version of the Lego movie does not include this scene, which means that it was only affected like only affecting like six people, but that's not the point. The scene, however, is very critical of Octan, a massive corporation, so it would make sense why AT&T would want to remove it. President Business is going to end the world? But he's such a good guy. And Octan, they make good stuff. Music, dairy products, coffee, TV shows, surveillance systems, all history books, voting machines. Wait a minute. Comically, in response to the AT&T accusations, the guy who posted this clip to YouTube commented, quote, No, kidding. Or... Period. Shameless. Too spacious. Too subversive for the deep state, I suppose. Exclamation point. Well, at least I've managed to reserve this message here. <laughs> for now. Okay, thanks, I guess, Mark. I have a DVD copy of the movie which has this scene on it, but thanks for the info. Deep State is a distinctly right-wing conspiracy theory, so that just proves the thesis of this entire video. Either way, Octane is perpetuating a society in which everyone presents as happy all the time, and while we never actually get to hear whether or not that happiness is genuine, it's presumed that the only reason why they're acting happy is because they are told to do so by the instructions. And in the same way that the only people who we hear actually voice any problems with the government in 1984 are Winston, Julia, and the prisoners, the only people who complain about President Business's government in the Lego movie are the master builders, which is what this movie calls the resistance. This movie is fucking stupid and I love it. In fact, we the audience don't even get to see what President Business is up to aside from his master plan. Taken at face value, President Business hasn't done anything wrong except for try to freeze everyone with glue. This is essentially the same way that conservatives view fascism. And I mean like actual conservatives, not fascists who pretend to be conservatives to save face. They're not critical of anything that Hitler or Mussolini did except for start a war and kill people. They don't care about propaganda, they don't care about book burning, they don't care about destroying any semblance of modern art. They even like that stuff, they just can't stomach genocide. Of course, that doesn't mean that they aren't knowingly or otherwise bigoted against the groups who are being genocided, it just means that they themselves would feel like they'd have a stain on their conscience if they let that happen. Which I think is why they turn around and deny past genocides, it lets them bask in the glory of their ancestors without also having to accept the fact that their ancestors were not perfect. If their ancestors let that happen, that sustain on their conscience. Despite not doing genocide, Octan does hold a fascistic control over Bricksburg. The media which is produced all fits to Octan's narrative. They control history, they control the democratic process, they have all of the power that the party has. Because we don't see anyone voice opposition to Octan until the final battle when it becomes socially acceptable to do so, we don't know how much they censor free speech though. There's a lot we really don't know because the story is told from the perspective of someone who at the beginning of the movie is indoctrinated. 1984 is a movie about someone who opposes the fascist government by circumstance being forced to conform, and the Lego movie is a movie about someone who supports the fascist government by circumstance being forced to oppose it. There's a common idea among conservatives and fascists, and by conservatives I mean people who pretend to be conservatives and are really fascists. Let's just call the old ones Walter and the young ones Drew, because I feel like those are the kinds of names someone like that would have. Anyways, Walters, Drews, and other fascists will say things like, 
The liberals just call anything they disagree with fascism, and they will most likely disregard everything I say by throwing me into a convenient box. Which is why I started the video with a long explanation of a book using 1980s style video. They will have lost patience with it and will not have reached this point. But Drew, if you are here, let me talk to you. First off, I'm not a liberal. Second off, yes, I don't like fascists. That is not why I call them fascists. Drew, let me, turn, let me explain this in terms that you might understand. When you call a gay person gay, that is not an insult. It is simply a statement of fact. Within your own mind, it may be an insult, but that doesn't make it not true. In the same way, I consider fascists to be an insult, but it may not have been intended as an insult. It may have been intended as a statement of fact, and the person receiving it may not internalize it as such. In the same way that someone might be insultingly called gay and then later find out that they're gay, someone might be insultingly called a fascist and then later found out that they're a fascist. And that, Drew, is what I'm doing to you. So there's this thing called horseshoe theory, used exclusively by centrists and selectively by Walters and Drews. Horseshoe theory was an idea pioneered by French philosopher and author Jean-Pierre Fay, and essentially pulls the one-dimensional political spectrum into the second dimension by turning it into a horseshoe. In doing so, he pulls the far left and far right closer together. This idea is often used by the far right to discredit the far left, because they simultaneously disavow fascism and emulate it. And because of this, people can simultaneously disavow Joe Biden as a fascist by pulling him farther to the left and then equating the far left and far right as both fascist. In contrast, the far left will explain why we are not like the Soviet government, namely that they were fascists. Oh, by the way, Jean-Pierre Fay was a fiction author. Based on our findings from the Lego movie, I propose an alternative to horseshoe theory that I call Lego Cape Theory. As opposed to taking the one-dimensional political spectrum and pulling it into 2D, I'm gonna take the 2D political spectrum and push it into 3D. So if you take the right here and tape it, you'll notice that the purest forms of fascism and the purest forms of capitalism are the same. The crossing over point between totalitarianism and capitalism is no government control of capitalism. I call this Lego cape theory, partially due to its ideological origins within the Lego movie and partially because that's how Lego capes fold. Lego cape theory is a bit hard to comprehend because it requires three dimensions, but if you just take a political compass and tape the top and bottom halves of the right edge to each other, you can make your own. Of course, most of your average horseshoe theory enthusiasts are about here, and interestingly, they oppose anti-fascism. Of course, they aren't too far from fascists. That's the point. They have shared interests, namely that people acting against fascism are people who are also acting against them. Not necessarily because they're all fascists, although many of them are, but because they have the same opponents. Fascism is not being opposed by people from their position. Look at the 2016 and 2020 elections. There are many conservatives who did not support Grapefruit Boy and his ambitions, but they were not actively going out and supporting against him. Some were, but not en masse, and those who did sabotage their own position. People near fascism tend to oblige because doing so allows for the downfall of somewhere further away on the Lego cape. In 1953, then alive President Dwight D. Eisenhower gave a speech at Dartmouth in which he argued that it would be against his own interests to ban leftist books because he believed that his own ideology would win in the free marketplace of ideas. I believe the United States is strong enough to expose the world its differing viewpoints, from those of what we call almost the man who has socialist leanings to the man who is so far to the extreme right that it takes a telescope to find him. But it's important in how he says it, because he allows anyone on the right into his free marketplace on ideas, but he cuts the line on the left with socialist leanings, which is not that far left of the global center. Despite this commitment to free speech, Eisenhower did then use a lot of his power to ban books that are left of center. At the time, the enemy was the post-Stalin Soviet Union, which was probably around the center of the authoritarian left spectrum, whereas Stalin was hard off-right. I say probably here because it's kind of hard to determine where historical figures and regimes fit on the political compass. There's just sort of a margin of error due to the fact that there's things we don't know that they said or why they did things, the fact that it's people and people are subjective, and also the fact that the political compass is fucking stupid. In the modern era, as opposed to the enemy of fascism being the authoritarian left quadrant, the enemy is the libertarian left quadrant. Fuck, I hate, why am I using the Simon Says Square? Either way, the modern book banning movement is specifically targeting the anti-fascist leftist youth. 
In April of 2022, the number of books currently banned in the United States reached an all-time high. Similar to before, book bannings happen almost exclusively in schools, but with the added effect of the internet, they aren't working as well. Since I had the idea for this video around the start of last year, 15 states, including my own, have banned teaching about racism, sexism, or queer people just in general. And I'm not a journalist. I could list examples that I ripped from articles that I read, but I don't have to. Because what I want to show is the impact of this, not that it's happening. If you're disputing that it's happening, you're just kind of an idiot. In particular, queer and trans people are targeted a lot because we tend to be the biggest target of fascism right now. One of the reasons why so few queer people were documented as out before recently is because of the limited access to information. In 1984, the party is trying to limit access to information and make it as if it never happened. In 2022, Walters and Drews are trying to delete information about queer people from the public consciousness to try to prevent quid quids from realizing that they're queer. They, fuck, if you're a kid and you just realized you're queer Starmer, God, I pity you so much. In 2022, Walters and Drews are trying to delete any information about queer people from the public consciousness to make it harder for kids to realize that they're queer. In 1933, the Nazi party burned 20,000 records because they were too supportive of queer people. Alongside queer people who deliberately had their own records destroyed after they died, like Emily Dickinson tried to do, we have precious little. Fascists succeeded at creating a society in which the behavior they didn't like was systematically scrubbed. And now that's changing, so the fascists of today aren't allowing for the work of the fascists of yesterday to continue. The internet is preventing total annihilation in these states where information has been banned. There are master docs to determine if you are any number of sexualities, such as the gender dysphoria bible, the am I a lesbian master doc, and the am I asexual master doc, which has been pretty useful to me. I put them as sources not because I feel like it's too much of a stretch to just say this thing exists and then not cite it, but because I want people to be able to have access to them. I want to make it easy for people to access them. Except the ace one, which I couldn't find for whatever reason. I very distinctly remember reading it and using it myself, but I could not find any record of it. Fascism presents itself as the only way for the nation to survive, often out of crisis. So if there's any other option, people will just pick that, because it doesn't require fascism. Martin Niemöller's first day came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist, was deliberate. They went after their political opponents first so that they could secure the power to commit genocide. The entire poem is about getting deeper and deeper into totalitarianism until there's no one to help you. Uh, coincidentally, Niemöller died in 1984. That has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's kind of funny. There's a reason why John Green sells the This Machine Kills Fascists as a laptop sticker. The internet is the purveyor of all information which benefits society, among other things. On the 8th of January, 2021, an admitted rapist, attempted fascist, self-described patriot, guy who tried to overthrow the government, an alleged human, Donald J. Trump, was banned from Twitter. On the same day, his son, Donald Trump 2 Electric Boogaloo, tweeted, quote, We are living in Orwell's 1984. Free speech no longer exists in America. It died with big tech, and what's left is only there for a chosen few. This is absolute insanity. This became a bit of a meme on Twitter because, of course, it misses the fucking point. The next day, cartoonist and alleged comedy artist Gary Varble posted this comic, which I feel no need to explain because the joke, in air quotes, is about as simple as the taste of baby teething biscuits. And also, you've definitely already seen it before. Whether it be as the original comic, a meme satirizing it, or an ASCII art simplification, you've seen this meme. This has caused the classic right-wing comparison of anything that anyone on the left or a liberal tries to say to 1984 to be a leftist meme. For example, oh no, the Coca-Cola Corporation won't let me buy bottles of Pride Coke that say come, so I have to put a space between each of the letters so it doesn't get caught by their automatic profanity filter. Literally 1984. And I feel like that's important to specify because probably about 99% of what you see posting about 1984 is a joke. Fuck, I do it. I think it's really funny to take a picture of anything that has the year 1984 on it and caption it literally 1984. I also think it's really funny to send my friends pictures of the book that say literally 1984 on them. That's why this video exists. I thought it would be really funny to title a video about 1984 literally 1984. 
So when I do this, I'm not making fun of the people who make memes about 1984, because I am one of them, and they're funny. I'm specifically making fun of the people who try to use literally 1984 as an argument for their right-wing ideology. Okay, just as a clarifying point, I'd like to mention that this video was both written and filmed before Elon Musk actually owned Twitter. I later make reference to him trying to buy Twitter, so at the time that this was filmed and at the time it was written, that was true. Uh, it has since become not true because uh, I did not have time to edit the video until relatively recently. So the literally 1984 argument is usually cited by people complaining about internet moderators punishing them for saying something. And to an extent, this is pretty agreeable. Having any rules at all does allow for some room for misinterpretation. But in well-defined and specific communities, such as Discord servers and subreddits, that's not what the rules are for. But in well-defined and specifically moderated communities, such as subreddits and Discord servers, that's not what the rules are for. The rules are for two things, judging newcomers based off of how well they fit the community's ideals, and preventing belligerent outsiders from showing up and allowing them to be removed for it in an internally consistent manner. And these rules are usually set up by the community at large, not out of a desire for censorship, but out of a desire for solidarity. For example, a Discord server that I used to run, and I guess technically still do even though it's mostly dead, had a rule banning exclamation points. This rule was implemented because we thought it was really annoying when people were overly enthusiastic about things in text. And I use this example partially because I think it's pretty funny and because it's really fucking petty, but mostly because the same thing is true for people who ban slurs or swearing or sexual images or whatever. Those rules are implemented to make the people who are in the space feel more comfortable. They are ideally rules implemented by the community to decide what they're comfortable with. Now, they don't necessarily have to be democratically instated, but they usually are because of the stipulation about the internet, which is that if you don't like a space, you can just leave. And this isn't like the this is America, if you don't like it, leave thing that conservatives like to say. There's nothing stopping you on the internet from just leaving a space that you don't like. There's no esoterically complicated process of moving to a different space. There are some that you have to be invited to, but there are enough public ones to join that you can just do that if you want to. And of course, there's no limited space in the metaverse. As much as Zark Muckerberg might want to create a metaverse real estate market where all the houses are NFTs, you don't have to live within the limited space confines of physical reality. You can just make your own if you want. There's nothing stopping you. In a sense, the internet is a testing grounds for a post-scarcity social order. Of course, it isn't really post-scarcity because real life isn't, but it's pretty close. Anyone can create a space for any niche group of people. Anyone can be the starting point. There's no restriction on where the people in that space are allowed to be from unless they happen to have banned the internet in one of those places. The internet's not a utopia. Shit still happens on it and because of it. But it is very good at simulating a utopic society in terms of how the social order would work. And by utopic, I don't mean in the sense of no suffering. I mean in the sense of creating the least suffering possible. When there are people with conflicting beliefs, this is the best we can currently do in a democratic means of communication. Ancient Rome didn't have the death penalty or prisons. They just exiled people if they broke the law. And in a post-scarcity society, that works as an actual punishment. People just move their social lives elsewhere, and they can actually do that. Internet may functionally be an economic monopoly. No one's going to create a social media site that can compete with Facebook crossed out with meta written next to it in my handwriting. But if you want to personally move your social life off of Facebook, you can do that. The way that free internet social groups work in terms of just being groups of friends interacting with each other, nothing has fundamentally changed in the way of censorship. And the development of new technologies actually made it more democratic. However, mass social media isn't that. Social media sites like Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram have moderators appointed by the company who remove content based off of what benefits them. This is unequivocally censorship, even if it's things you don't like. Twitter banning fascists for saying shit that is fascist is unequivocally censorship. Now, it causes a net benefit to society, so when a fascist is banned, that is good, but that doesn't change the definition of censorship not to include it. I'm not going to try to claim that the censoring of fascists is bad. I'm going to try to claim that it's not the company's responsibility to do that. The apprehension to the word censorship is why they don't actually ban fascism. They ban things like inciting violence, deliberately spreading false information, and harassment. And this gets a lot of fascists because fascism is full of liars and hypocrites. In fact, Twitter did actually have a system created to ban fascists 
but they realized that they couldn't use it because doing so would ban a lot of Republican politicians, which would violate the Fairness Doctrine. The public ones get to stay on because they're profitable, but if Jackson the fascist starts harassing random people of color, he will get banned. And if you're saying that this is still censorship, you're right. There is a better way to do this. Reddit works on a system of upvotes and downvotes. A comment to dislikes and a comment to likes cancel each other out. If a comment gets too many downvotes, it becomes hidden. You have to make the conscious decision to read something which, statistically, just because of math, you're more likely to disagree with than you are to agree with. Reddit's moderation is also outsourced. The people who moderate subreddits are the people who are passionate about them. They aren't elected, which isn't great, but an individual subreddit could decide to do that. The moderators moderate and decide the rules of the subreddit, which are chosen as I mentioned earlier. Reddit does, however, have general moderators who moderate the general rules of the site. They also run on guilty until proven innocent. I got suspended from all of Reddit for three days for posting a trans supportive meme to a transphobic subreddit just to the fuck with the people that are on it. The mod's argument was that it was offensive to marginalized communities, which is the exact opposite of what I was doing. Obviously, this report was just made by some transphobe who abused the reporting system. Of course, the fact that someone's account is suspended for making a meme that doesn't break the rules is dumb. However, there's also no stakes. Even if I was banned permanently, I would have just created a new account and acted like nothing happened. And it's fun to fuck with people and get banned from subreddits that you disagree with. One of my friends got banned from the Louder with Crowder subreddit because she posted gay porn on it. These rules are still corrupt though, and they do show an ability by the corporations to oust people who disagree with their ideals from the popular narrative. However, currently the rules just ban violence at all, which isn't really that different from the rules of the US government. This is important to reiterate to all of the liberals. The fact that social media sites are not the government and therefore they are allowed to censor people is not a good argument. It's a legal argument as to why these things are allowed to continue, but it isn't an actual coherent argument because of Lego cape theory. The government and corporations, if we even decide they should be allowed to exist at all, should be beholden to the same regulations. And the US government does not protect all free speech. US law does recognize a number of important restrictions to free speech. These include obscenity, fraud, child pornography, harassment, incitement to illegal conduct and imminent lawless action, true threats, and commercial speech such as advertising, copyright, or patent rights. Hate speech is usually protected unless it's also a threat, which it usually is, but our legal system is so fucked up that it isn't usually tried as such. There is one glaring omission from that list, and that's libel, which is deliberately publishing a lie meant to disparage someone. By pure luck, what happens to be the moderation rules on Twitter does tend to line up with the current law, but that is subject to change. Elon Musk tried to buy Twitter, and as I'm recording this, like two days ago, they just said, no, fuck you, we're not going to let you do that. But anyone who buys the company is allowed to do whatever the fuck they want with it. One of the things that Elon Musk said he was going to do was reinstating Donald Trump's account. And while that's not going to happen, because Elon Musk isn't going to buy Twitter, Someone else could theoretically buy Twitter and do the same thing. We almost never consider restricting counterproductive uses of free speech to be morally compromised, almost for practical reasons. If we apprehend people who make threats, they won't be able to follow through with them. If we fire journalists who deliberately lie, journalism stays accurate. These same rules apply on the internet. While it may be possible to create a society where there's no impetus to say things like this in the first place, for where we're at, this is the best we can do. While this is an interesting conversation to be had about internet censorship, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned 1984 in a while. And that's because I feel like just illustrating what is actually happening is enough to show why it's not like 1984. Not only would it be required to call the current US government 1984 if you also want to call the internet 1984, but 1984 is not just about being prevented from saying things. There's a lack of privacy in conjunction with it. Because you could be reasonably caught at any moment, you can't really say anything. It's not just illegal, it's also functionally impossible. If you say the wrong thing on Twitter, you might not get caught. Even if you do, you might be able to weasel your way out of consequences. And even if you can't, really, what are those consequences? You just get banned and have to start a new account, or you get muted until you delete your tweet. If you say the wrong thing in 1984, you just roll a perception check, and if you fail, you die and get tortured. Uh, not in that order. This doesn't happen in the US, even if we're presuming we're talking about the exceptions to free speech. However, since I don't believe that the government or corporations are good and that the rules should be enforced by specific communities, there functionally is no difference here. Both Twitter and the party are enforcing their rules based off of what benefits them. 
at the moment, the rules on some social media sites are acting how they're supposed to, but there's no one holding them to that. Last Christmas, I made a video titled, A Christmas Story is Frankly Not a Very Good Movie, in my opinion. Yes, I did just cite my own video as a source, fuck you. One of my main talking points in that video was that a lot of the main character's sympathy comes from the instinct that any parent restricting their child's autonomy is bad. And that's a good instinct to have. Do not forget it if you have your own children. The reason why this is relevant is that if you live in a Western country, childhood is the most censorship you really get. I mean, there are exceptions, such as all of the people currently threatening to kill Supreme Court justices, which is absolutely an exercising of free speech that should be allowed. There are banned books and other ideological attempts to shut down the left, but they're almost always targeted at children. They ban books in schools. They ban drag shows specifically for children. They allow for religious indoctrination of them, etc. The perceived innocence of children is a tactic used frequently, almost always by the right, when trying to do something that hurts children. It has a fucking Wikipedia page, that's how common it is. The biggest problem with how we currently raise children is ideological indoctrination, and fuck, what else is there? It's undeniably wrong to indoctrinate your children into an ideology, but if you don't do it, they'll just become neoliberal Christians because that's the prevailing ideology. It's still indoctrination, there's no way to create an ideologically neutral childhood in our current society. So the next best thing is telling them what is true and not withholding the opportunity for them to become something else. They will logically tend towards what is true and the logical thing to do, which fun fact, is not the right or liberals, it's just leftism. <laughs> When I was about 12, my grandmother told me that when she was younger, she looked at all of the religions and decided that her specific sect of Christianity was the one that was correct. From the moment she said that, I knew she was lying, but allowing your children to pick something that is different from what you're presenting them with is an actually good strategy when what you're presenting is true and your kid isn't gullible. That's the argument that Dwight D. Eisenhower was making at his Dartmouth speech. It's just that he happened to be arguing with an incorrect ideology. However, this usually doesn't happen. <laughs> There's a nearly billion dollar market centered around restricting what children see on the internet. And not just the internet, there's also the ESRB and MPAA who are ostensibly nonprofits but only function to allow parents to censor information from their children. They aren't legally enforced, but they might as well be. Almost every store refuses to sell games that don't have the letter on the box, and most stores will ID you to make sure you're not buying a game that you're not supposed to based off the number on your ID. Shout out to Video Games Etc. in the Lantern Park Plaza Strip Mall in Coralville, Iowa for letting me buy Halo when I was 13 and being general cool people. Basically, people have to enforce the rules because people will complain if they don't. People also complain if they do because parents don't read the back of the box and see that it says intense violence slash violenza intensa, and then that's just your fucking problem. If your kid wants it, what's stopping them from playing it? If it grosses you out, just don't watch them playing it. Usually with things like internet filters, parents' goal is to prevent things like the liberal agenda or the gay or atheism from corrupting their child. But here's the secret. They're the same as the MPAA and ESRB. The 2014 queer romance movie Love is Strange was hit with an R rating by the MPAA on bullshit grounds, and at the same time, the MPA Canada gave it a PG rating, which is what it realistically should have had. The driving force behind these rating systems is concerned parents, yes, but it's also the question, is this subversive? Look at the most recent G-rated movies. They're all nature documentaries or TV movies for small children, and other than that, it's the most cookie-cutter bullshit for the past seven years. In order for a movie to be completely quote-unquote safe, it needs to not really be about anything. For fuck's sake, The Incredibles is PG. The act of having anything worth analyzing in the text is seen as a flaw in the eyes of the MPAA, since what if you watch Onward and you remember that one scene where there was that one cop who mentioned having a girlfriend or a wife, I don't remember which, no one remembers which, and you don't have your parental guidance there to explain to your child about how the gay liberal agenda of the Walt Disney Corporation is trying to turn your kids gay. And God forbid Peter realizes that Onward is a movie about toxic masculinity and how it can come from daddy issues and how that negatively impacts your relationships with everyone in your life, including your own family, without mommy there to tell him that that's not actually true. Uh, no one clip me saying mommy out of context and use it for anything, okay? The same thing happens with movies for older kids and teenagers, except they're just more likely to more blatantly state that, no, our society is fucked and we need to fix it. These systems create a natural tendency for pandering to an audience and having movies with more complex themes have more gore or violence or sex or swearing than movies that have less complex themes. This then allows people to then turn around and then say that the more subversive movies are intended for adults and the less subversive movies are intended for children. And doing that 
causes movies that are more subversive to be kept out of the hands of people who might realize that society is fucked because of them. If that seems a bit conspiratorial, the MPAA evolved out of the Hays Code, which was a set of rules that literally forbade any morally complex characters because it might influence people into immorality. Keep in mind that the repeated banning of 1984 is done because it is subversive. Media about how restricting access to media is bad gets banned because it's subversive to the system which currently exists. And yet no one compares the ESRB or MPAA to 1984 when they compare fucking Twitter moderation to 1984. And they impose an actual barrier. You can't just press create new account and then be allowed to enter an R-rated mood. 1984 isn't just about punishing people for breaking the rules, it's also about putting in physical barriers to make it harder to break the rules. I know from experience of solving logistics problems that the latter is much easier and much more effective than the former. Which makes it really ironic how Ben Shapiro, leading Won't Somebody Think of the Children arguer, fucking nuts whenever he sees a copy of 1984. Imagine British people being like, petrol prices are quite high right now, innit? So the first thing we have to note about Ben Shapiro is that it's really difficult to find everything that he's ever said. He gets made fun of so often and his tweets are shitposted so often that for every three Ben Shapiro tweets that you see, one is fake and one's been deleted. This has nothing to do with the point that I'm about to make, but it's ironically kind of similar to the party. The other thing about Ben Shapiro is that it's really difficult to research his takes about 1984 because he was actually born in 1984. Not only does it make him 38 years old, which makes his actions even sadder than they already are, but it also means that the number 1984 might just show up as a search term in any biography of the man. Since January of 2022, Ben Shapiro has ran the Third Thursday Book Club, with whose trailer fucked up my YouTube recommendations. In his reveal trailer, he essentially says, watch my streams and you'll get smarter. <laughs> he even has strategy guides prescribing how you should read a book that is in his book club specifically centered around books that are about independent thought. So let's just watch the VOD of his 1984 stream, because even if we don't get smarter, at least we'll be able to hear the other side of the argument. And oh wait, you have to pay money. As is frequent for grifts like this, the people who gain gain in two ways, because they both get money from their audience and they get to indoctrinate them. They have multiple perks for giving them money, such as the leftist tears tumbler, which I'd be lying if I didn't say I kind of wanted ironically, but I'm not going to be paying them a whole bunch of money for it. There's a lot to unpack, such as that Insider is more expensive than Insider Plus, even ignoring the sale that was happening as I recorded this. Insider Plus does have more content than Insider, despite being counterintuitively cheaper. $15 doesn't seem like that much money to roast Ben Shapiro on the internet and then also get a Tumblr that says leftist tears that I can drink Coke that came in bottles that says cum on it out of. Except that's not actually how much it costs. It's actually billed annually, which means I have to pay him $180 for a Tumblr that costs $18 plus shipping according to this eBay listing. So in lieu of Ben Shapiro's commentary on 1984, let's instead watch this PragerU video that is a book club starring Dave Rubin and Michael Knowles, because basically every figure on the right is exactly the fucking same and has the same takes about everything. In fact, this video was released a year and a half before Benjamin Shapiro and Shaman's commentary, so if anything, Ben stole it from them. The video starts 20 seconds in with an ad read for a website where you can get smarter by pretending to read books on the internet, which is really just emblematic of their whole movement. In fact, it's not actually about getting smarter, it's about pretending to be smarter so you seem smarter at parties by pretending to have read books which is even more emblematic of their entire movement. I did actually read the book, and to their credit, it seems so have they. Every single quote that they pulled is real. I know this because I checked. Before you even read the quote, you could literally pick any <laughs> quote yes. from the book, and it is applicable now. Okay, challenge accepted. He could feel her breasts ripe yet firm through her overalls. Her body seemed to be pouring some of its youth and vigor into his. Is that applicable, Dave? I know the answer is no because you're gay. I know that that's hyperbolic, but it's also very funny. Dave Rubin goes on a bit about how the left on Twitter is the same as 1984 because we call things into question. Are you sure we read the same book, Dave? Because I read a book about how you're not supposed to question things because of what the government tells you, rather than you should question things the government tells you. If you are so confident that your convictions are true, why won't you let people question it? If they do so fairly, they will come to the conclusion that your ideas are correct. I mean, they won't actually, because they're not correct. 
But if you're so confident that they are correct, you should allow for an opportunity where they can win. By saying that people being allowed to question things is bad, you are essentially saying that your ideas would not survive if people were allowed to question them. What I f completely forgot about that I found was interesting is that one of the things that they're also trying to sort of untie, that the Ministry of Untr uh, Truth is trying to untie, is the idea of time. And it does feel like right now that time feels a little weird. It's partly because of the lockdown, partly because you know we're we're trapped at home, we're all on social media. But doesn't time feel mm. sort of sort of strange right now? Like anything could happen at any given minute. Right. And I think that all leads to a sort of well, sick society where two plus two eventually will be five if they just tell you. Dave, what the fuck does that mean? Just because you can't keep track of how many days have passed, even though every time you open your phone it tells you what day it is, doesn't mean that the government can tell you that two plus two equals five and people will believe it. All the people that are running around now procl proclaiming that the rest of us are racists, they're the ones that are pushing racism into society every right. everywhere. They're the ones that are saying black people should have special dorms. Not only are no sources cited, which I'm not gonna knock against them because this is just an inherent problem with recording an unscripted conversation, the dorm thing also isn't true. These dorms are voluntary, and NYU, which has one, doesn't even have a full dorm. They just have one floor that's considered a themed floor, which are apparently very common there and also would not fit all of the black students at the school. Stanford's website explicitly says that only about half of their students in their supposedly black dorm are black, and Cornell's doesn't say shit, but apparently they don't have air conditioning. I can't find anything about Western Washington University, but I'm going to presume it's the same, and even if it isn't, that's definitely the minority. I wasn't able to find anything about Western Washington University from a reputable source, but I would presume it's the same, and even if it isn't, it would just be a case of someone using leftist language to do something horrible, just like the party does. Cornell and Stanford's dorms even have the same name, which I think is kind of funny. This is a very minor topic in that video, but I feel like it's something that I want to go down a rabbit hole on to prove that basically everything that they say isn't true, and also because I spent an hour researching it and I want you to come along with me. Dave Rubin goes on a tangent about The Handmaid's Tale, which I haven't seen or read. He also calls it The Handmaid's Tale, which is not what it's called. And then he goes on and starts talking about how this book about misogyny is somehow just like a real society, but somehow because of something that the left is doing. Before I watched this video, I was expecting it to be a lot more of, boohoo, I got banned from Twitter for dead naming Elliot Page. But it really illustrates something different. They talk about doublethink, and yet they misapply it completely. And they really only apply it to race for whatever reason. They're really focused on the take that BLM is somehow racist. But they never really justify why, they just kind of say it. Instead of saying something is bad, you'll say it's ungood, or double plus ungood. Right, right. but so what does that sound like we're, right now? It sounds like he, him, they, yes. her, all of these things. Ah uh, yes, new words added to the dictionary. Like he, him, they, and her. Also, side note, I haven't seen a single person on the internet say that they use they, her pronouns. Usually someone in that case would say that they use they, she pronouns. Not like Dave Rubin is going to respect your pronouns anyway, but that's not the point. I'm not going to say that George Orwell had a good take on trans people. He died in 1950. He almost certainly did not. But I am going to say that using newspeak to apply to political correctness fundamentally misses the point because words just change over time. There's an urban legend about how Quakers made people stop using the word thou because they used it so much and people didn't want to be associated with them because they thought they were annoying. It's generally not believed to be true, but the idea of eliminating the honorific that they were fighting for did happen. We no longer have different forms of you based on social status. Protests did not shift the language, but the language shifting and the protests were both caused by a change at the time towards more egalitarian language. In the same way, the adoption of gender neutral pronouns in languages like Spanish, which did not have them before, is not because of the liberal agenda. It's happening because people are now talking about concepts in those languages which no one was talking about before, and words are now required to discuss them. Michael Mole cites an essay by George Orwell that has nothing to do with their talking about because it has one sentence where he says that no one knows what fascism means anymore. And I know it has nothing to do with what they're talking about because I fucking read it and it was a waste of my time. His essay is mostly complaining about people using words that he doesn't like, like a high school English teacher who banned certain words from his classroom because people were using them too often in their essays. But in the same fucking essay, he talks about how the degradation of fascism is a deliberate ploy by fascists so that people will not be able to identify fascism. Which is now really funny because these fascists are using it to deflect blame of being a fascist. Dave Rubin even says he agrees with this, but he doesn't recognize that the list of all the things that people are being called fascist for are things that he does. Michael Mull tries to make this point that political correctness is somehow tied to wealth, 
which because he doesn't cite his source, I can't actually check to see if that's true or not. But in the way that he says political correctness, it probably isn't true. Minorities of any type, racial, gender, sexual, whatever, are more likely to have language that they don't want used against them and are also more likely to not have money. Near the end, Dave Rubin leaves us with a thought, which is a question that was asked five fucking minutes ago, about how leftism is supposedly entering society through liberalism and trying to instate the party's ideology from that. And apparently that's what 1984 means. Before this, they mentioned the three major modern ideologies, fascism, communism, and liberalism. They mentioned that the first two have been tried and failed and then just fizzled out, which neither of those are really true. Fascism never really went away. And communism was never really tried because the Soviet Union was kind of an intermediary period. They never actually succeeded at getting to where they wanted to be with communism. In my video, PewDiePie Gamers and the Ideology of Memes, I used the quote, anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools, to describe PewDiePie in a flowery and kind of witty way. Here it actually fucking applies. This is what that quote was meant to be used for. Not necessarily in a literal sense. While these people do parrot anti-Semitism all the time, I don't believe that they did so in this video. There's a lot of dog whistles and there's no way that I know all of them, so it's possible they did and I just didn't catch it. But to my knowledge, they didn't actually say anything blatantly anti-Semitic. But in a more broad sense, bigotry is the socialism of fools. They get so close to making a leftist point and then they just take a wild left turn into moon logic. This entire time they're trying to avoid stepping on the eggshells of saying something leftist. They make every argument that they can that isn't explicitly leftist and then say, we don't have any more time, and then just end the video. The things that they say are, of course, either the most service level things, i.e. the things your teacher would expect you to say, or they're just bad arguments. So then why do so many people cite this book as an argument that the liberal agenda or just trans people in general are a path that leads to authoritarianism? What led Benjamin Shapiro Enchman to tweet this quote from 1984 on an article about a trans guy talking about his cock, which had nothing to do with the topic at hand? Obviously the book has a lot of visceral imagery that people dislike, but there's a more specific reason as to why it's become such a popular argument among people on the right. One of the most interesting things about the memification of 1984 is that it's now reached a point where it's really difficult to find conspiracy theorists posting about it because it's been memed so much that Twitter and any search you make is just full of people shitposting. And also it's worth noting that this trend has largely died out. This video took me a year to make and if I started by doing research on social media instead of reading the book like a lot of these people do, I would have probably found more cases of people posting about it. The current 1984 discourse is full of a lot of people just tweeting quotes from the book without any context, which means that it's perfectly in line with the current 1984 discourse to just tweet the 1984 sex passage. Well, the one I've been repeating, there are many of them. But it's kind of important how dated this discourse is. The book club video is from July of 2020. You may have noticed that they're not wearing masks. In recent years, the right has been built on a foundation of making shit up. How'd you like that transition? I won't try to debunk it here because I know from experience that proving the falsity of the sources that they use doesn't fucking work because they will always just try to attack whatever you're saying using ad hominem, even if your argument is completely valid. The modern state of propaganda from sources like Facebook or the Joe Rogan Experience or Alex Jones' neighbor-filled mouth inherently causes people to believe in an us versus them dichotomous system. To an extent, they believe that because it's true, but it's only true because they make it true. You know, they're the ones who come out of the woodwork and just deny whatever has been the scientific consensus for decades. There are some beliefs in this case which are not inherently contradictory. You can believe that ivermectin cures COVID and also that the COVID vaccine works. You'd be wrong, but it wouldn't be inherently double think. However, when they are harmful, i.e. people refusing to take the vaccine, they are taking a request to do the right thing as an attack on their beliefs, which is all that they know about 1984. Because let's be realistic here, not very many of them have actually read it. And that's through no fault of their own. I'm sure someone is going to take what I've said and turn around and use that in an argument without actually reading the book too. And that's not their fault or mine. It's just the kind of book that not a lot of people would like to read unless you like analysis. So unless you happen to know a lot about the book from other sources, all you're going to know is things that have entered the zeitgeist. Michael Mould makes this point, which is unsurprisingly wrong, about how many words from 1984 have come into common usage in our real life as metaphors. Now maybe I'm clueless, but I had never heard the terms memory hole or new speak or double think in anything that doesn't relate to the book itself. I have, however, heard the terms thought police, thought crime, and idiom 2 plus 2 equals 5 in contexts that do not have to do with 1984. I have no idea why and it doesn't really matter, but a lot of the things that have come into common usage outside of the context of 1984 are things that have to do with the idea of 
having your ideas broken down and having false ideas being thrust upon you. And keep in mind, from their perspective, they are the ones who are factually correct. They're wrong when they say that, but that is still what they believe. And also from their perspective, we are factually incorrect. That's what they mean when they say they think the left is like 1984. They think that we are factually incorrect in thrusting our supposedly factually incorrect beliefs onto them. Which fuck, if that makes someone like the party, then proselytizing any religion you don't believe in makes someone like the party. Knowles and Rubin don't really talk that much about the totalitarian aspect of 1984 society, which is really smart on their part, because if they do, that makes people realize how fascist it really is. For the most part, they talk about how the degrading of the truth is just like trans people or the left, and how 1984 and 2020 are exactly the same guys over and over and over again. Almost every joke that they make is just the same structure repeatedly about how 1984 is just like now, and the only time they ever laughed at anything they said were when they said the words liberal agenda unironically. The only other thing they talk about is doublethink, which is really interesting because the way they do it is they strawman the left and talk about how the strawman is different from what the left actually believes. You know, I could strawman their points and call that doublethink too, but I don't have to. They do it for me. You see, fascism is full of liars and hypocrites not lying hypocrites. There are two types of fascists. Let's call the acolytes the outer party and the demagogues the inner party because that's what Orwell does. The outer party are hypocrites. They believe things that are contradictory because that's what the inner party told them to believe. The inner party are liars. They come up with the lies that contradict each other so they can hide what they actually believe from the outer party. By lying, they more easily convince the outer party and beyond. As I've already mentioned a few times now, Winston's prime example of doublethink is that of democracy. He mentions that the party posits both that it is democratic and therefore good, and that democracy is impossible and therefore dictatorship is inevitable. Similarly, he claims how the party claims to be acting in the best interest of humanity, and he doesn't know whether or not they actually believe that. But it doesn't matter. Regardless of what they believe, they are not acting in the best interest of humanity. Later on, he brings up the topic of 2 O'Brien, who says, The party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We're not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power, not wealth or luxury or long life or happiness. Only power, pure power. The inner party is willing to lie to let the outer party just be hypocrites. In real life, the doctrine makers used euphemisms and dog whistles in place of their true beliefs with callous disregard of cohesion, only handing out like Halloween candy, any belief whose means are the same as the means to the ideology's ends. That's why they simultaneously believe that it's literally 1984 if you violate their free speech by asking them not to say slurs, and if you use your own to call them a fascist. Because fascism, the ideology the straw men were built to disguise, is an ideology of bigotry. Bigotry is allowed. At the same time, they don't want people to figure out that they're fascist, so they keep up with a snappy response for when someone calls them one. Double think within the right is deliberate. It's the same as the party. They don't actually believe that trans people pose some nebulous threat to children, and also that it's okay to have child brides. They just think that pedophilia and owning women are okay, and on a completely unrelated point, hate trans people. It's not actually a contradictory belief, they just obfuscate it to appear that way because what they actually believe is so heinous that they can't say it. Fellow leftist YouTuber Ian Danskin argues that this evolved naturally to win arguments with liberals on the internet, but I disagree. These beliefs are also held by politicians off the internet who dip out of any argument they find themselves in, especially when their inconsistencies are pointed out. The inner party isn't dumb, Knowles and Rubin are smart enough to know how to avoid the leftist parts of 1984 in an unscripted conversation. Either that or there's someone behind the camera who selectively quoted and wrote up a plan for what they can say, but at that point what's the difference? These people listen to their demagogues, many attempted a coup d'etat to keep their fascist leader in power just because he asked. 1984 is a legitimately horrifying book. Because of that, I found it very difficult to read when I was feeling particularly empowered. Honestly, one of the things that's most horrifying about it is the same thing that's horrifying about real fascists and cultists. Unwavering loyalty to an idea that you haven't been allowed to fully understand. You cannot convince these people, at least not by winning an argument with them. They're either going to lie or be wrong, and no matter what, if you're like a hypocrite who cannot be convinced of anything you say. They either don't care about coherent argument or don't believe in the things that you're accusing them of. And the inner party never will. For fuck's sake, they're the ones who made up the arguments to make themselves more palatable. Converting the inner party is a fool's errand, and the outer party doesn't care about coherent arguments, so what's the point of analyzing their arguments? The leading ideology of the right is fascism, but disguised in something else. Not necessarily conservatism, but aism, the belief in no coherent ideology. If the incoherence of such a system is broadcast, no one wants to join that. Fascism is not an ideology people will join if they are presented with an alternative. 
fuck, the rise of modern fascism and fascism in the 20th century and in 1984 are all punctuated by a legitimately broken society in which fascism is offered as the solution. So don't let them offer it. I've said that 1984 is about many things, and that's intentional. I believe that 1984 is about many things. <laughs> Every single one of those statements of things I've said 1984 is about are true. I offer these ideas partially because they're true, and partially to show the depth of this book and how well it captures fascism. Because that's what 1984 is about above all else. Fascism. Because everything I've said up until now are the pillars of fascism. They're themes of the book because it's a book about fascism. Fascism is more literally 1984 than literally anything else in all of human history. At time of recording. Thank you.